stop it too. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks very much, my friends, for having me. Um, my name is Ian S. and I'm a recovered alcoholic. And I'm joining you this afternoon to talk about one of the uh, great chapters of this great book. I mean, a lot of them are pretty great, but more about alcoholism, which is where we're picking up today, is really the document that helped me understand the nature of the predicament I was in. And until I understood that predicament, there was very little chance that I was gonna be able to do anything constructive about it. And so I really credit this chapter and its description of the alcoholic with essentially saving my life. We're resuming our discussion from last time. We left off at page 33. And we just told the story about the man of 30 who was doing a great deal of spree drinking, nervous in the morning. He decides to stop and he stops on his own power and remains bone dry for 25 years. Then he thinks, all right, I've been a good boy. I'll start, uh, you know, maybe I can handle myself this time. He starts drinking again, finds he can't handle himself, tries to stop again, and discovers he can't. And he goes to pieces, he's gone. So as they say in page 33, this case contains a powerful lesson. Most of us have believed that if we remained sober for a long stretch, we could thereafter drink normally. I must confess that I entertained this belief um, much sooner than 25 years in some cases. I would sometimes think to myself, in fact, I would often think to myself, after a good long weekend, uh, or certainly a couple of weeks, well, wasn't I maybe making too much of a small matter? I'll be all right now. Things were crazy back then. Incidentally, I also had versions of this idea that my, the troubles I'd created with my drinking in the past were related to circumstances that weren't in my life anymore. Oh, you know, back then I had this going on, I had that going on, and I was all screwed up, and I was, I was, you know, using alcohol in this kind of abusive way, but now I won't do that. Now I won't do that. I've settled down, I've leveled out. But just like the man of 30, here's a man who's at 55 years, found he was just, just where he had left off at 30. And they say, we've seen the truth demonstrated again and again, once an alcoholic, always an alcoholic. They say this, that they mean this in the sense that commencing a drink after a period of sobriety, we are in a short time as bad as ever. The phenomenon of craving, this thing that is in me that makes it impossible for me to drink normally, the abnormal reaction that I have to alcohol is not something that can be healed. It's not something that goes away. In fact, if anything, it's progressive. That's what the man of 30 sort of illustrates in some ways, is that he's able to stop on his own power the first time. But I suppose this would be more in the nature of the mental obsession. The second time around, he finds he can't stop at all, and he goes to pieces. So over any considerable period, I found that this was true for me also. I had less and less control over the amount that I drank as time passed. I used to be able to, you know, when I was in college, I didn't have any money. So I certainly wasn't drinking every day. And when I did, I didn't drink as much as I would eventually uh, do as an adult, because again, I was kind of broke and I wasn't, you know, I wasn't too hard up for it. Later on, that became not possible for me. So that's why if we are planning to stop drinking, there must be no reservation of any kind, nor any lurking notion that someday we will be immune to alcohol. One of the most common things I hear, one of the most common things I say is people who are at the precipice of accepting certain truths about themselves, but they have an event in the future that they explicitly hold out as, well, I'm not going to ever drink again. I'm willing to never drink again, except one day, you know, if my son gets married, maybe I'll have a glass of wine at the wedding reception. It's a real example I remember hearing from a guy the first time I went to rehab. Very nice guy. Now, I don't know what happened to that guy. I wish him well. And maybe he did do that, and maybe he didn't do it. But just think about the logic that that displays for a moment. You're thinking to the future. You're thinking about some special occasion. You're thinking about your son's wedding. And you're thinking, well, on that occasion, because it's so special, because it's so meaningful, and that would sort of justify a deviation from the normal rule that I'll live by all the time. That sort of demonstrates that in your heart, you really do believe you'll be able to control the amount you take at that wedding don't you? Because of course, you're not planning to get drunk and ruin your son's wedding, I hope, or you're not planning to, you know, whatever it is, whatever event, whatever special thing you've got in mind, you're not planning to hold out and drink to ruin it. Of course you're not. But 
of course, if you'll be able to control, and this is how it works, this is how it'll work in your head. If I can control my drinking then, because it really matters, and I really am serious about it, well, then probably I can control my drinking on whatever occasion you're having this thought in. If I really try, if it really matters, I just need to be, and pretty soon you're just collapsing back into the old thing that you used to tell yourself all the time, which is, I'll just try harder this time. That's why we have to have no reservation, because we have to accept what this really means. Folks, I hope and I believe I will never drink again. Now, I don't know how much longer I'll live, but I hope it's decades. And I hope sincerely that I go to my deathbed, never having ruined another important occasion, never having ruined another special thing, because I can't control my drinking. And I hope I never forget that. Now, of course, there's a way that we make sure we never forget that. It's not by trying harder. It's by practicing the principles of this program. But we'll get there. Back to the book. Young people may be encouraged, they say, by this man's experience, the man of 30, to think that they can stop, as he did, on their own willpower. I would say I run into all sorts of people, some of them not so young, who think that they can stop on their own willpower. And it's not just this man's experience that encourages them. They see people in their lives sometimes, or maybe they imagine people, who can stop drinking on their own willpower. They just decide to stop and do it. Uh, my mother is actually a person in this category. Uh, you know, fairly late in her life. I mean, not that late. She's alive and she's well. She decided that alcohol was not doing anything for her in her life that she wanted to preserve. And she decided she's just going to live a sober existence. And she did. That was years ago. And she's never been a meeting. Uh, ne she's never been an AA member. Um, she has peer support in this, but nothing like the kind of spiritual recovery program, the 12 steps that we talk about here. She decided that she wanted to stop drinking and she did. So other people like me might look at that and think, I, if they can do it, I can do it. And here's the problem. First of all, as the authors say, we doubt if many of them can do it because none will really want to stop. That's the first problem is before you've really gotten bit hard by all of the consequences that this causes for you, often it is very difficult to accept the leveling of pride the self-searching that anything like a 12-step program requires for its successful consummation. But also, even before you get to that, you don't want to give up alcohol. What you want to get rid of are the problems, but you don't really want to give up drinking and you don't really necessarily believe you have to yet. And as they note in the, in the book, hardly one of them, because of the peculiar mental twist already acquired, will find he can win out. What's that a reference to? That's a reference to a concept that's already been introduced over and over by this section of the book, which is that at a certain point in the drinking career of every alcoholic, they pass into this region where it is not possible for them anymore to stop drinking on the basis of willpower, where no matter how good the reasons are, no matter how much they want to do it, they will find that their mind lets them down over and over. Something about their memory doesn't work right or their they enter this confused mental blank spot, which is what these chapters are really all about. And they'll find that they cannot exercise their willpower in the ordinary way because they will become convinced over and over, and this is what we're gonna talk about very soon, that this time will be different, or I've got a good reason this time, or maybe they just don't think about it at all. Um, several of our crowd, they say men of 30 or less had been drinking only a few years, but they found themselves as helpless, that is as helpless to stop and stay stopped as those who had been drinking 20 years. And I identify actually with both parts of that sentence. I think, I'm 40 now, but I think that uh, in my 20s, it was impossible for me to stop and stay stopped. I made some attempts in my 20s, some more serious than others, but it was clear that I was not able to drink safely. And in, sometimes I would experiment with periods of sobriety. And I would find I couldn't stick to it. I wasn't involved in anything like AA. I convinced most people who are, think they have a drinking problem, the first thing they try to do is not, well, let me just rush over to the local church basement and go to Alcoholics Anonymous. No, first thing they try to do is, why don't I just knock it off, right? Just like anything else in your life that's causing you a problem, you just try to stop. And then when you start back up again, you kind of don't think about it that much. And maybe things aren't so bad just yet. And so you think, well, that was good. I settled down for a while. But is that really what's going on? Or have you already developed the obsession of the mind that will make it impossible for you to stop even when you really want to? I suppose you'll find out as you live longer. And I did. 
They note that to be gravely affected in this way, it's not necessary to drink for a long time or to take the quantities that some of us have. Uh, apparently, this is particularly true of the women that they knew in the early fellowship, some of whom often turned into the real thing, uh, like, you know, like us, and were gone beyond recall in a few years. All the reasons that causes this, you know, peculiar mental twist to be acquired, we don't really know, and we don't really need to know. Is it easier for women? Is it easier for men? Is it easier for young people? Is it easier for old people? Is it easy for this? Is it, you know, is it easy for a Presbyterian or a Baptist? I don't know. And who cares? All that mattered to me was, did this description identify me roughly? And it definitely did. You know, they also say that certain drinkers who would be greatly insulted if called alcoholics are astonished at their inability to stop. We encounter this a lot these days, I think. I run into people. I was just talking with somebody today who said, I don't like the term alcoholic. It's unscientific. It's dated. And what we should really be talking about is alcohol use disorder, right? They don't want to describe themselves as alcoholics because it sounds like some kind of final judgment. They think, <laughs> hint, hint, they think they might get over this one day. And so they want to talk about alcohol use disorder. And listen, that's fine. I'm not a doctor. I don't have a DSM-5 sitting on my shelf. I don't even really know what the diagnostic criteria for alcohol use disorder are, although every doctor I've ever had wrote it on the little insurance form, so I guess it probably has something to do with my life, but I don't really know. But those people, what very often happens to them is they don't want to be called alcoholics, and then they get a nasty surprise. They can't stop, right? They do what the doctor says. I did what the doctor said. They go to the therapist. I went to the therapist. They go to the treatment center. They go to this. They go to that. They go to the gym more. They eat better. They do all this stuff. They read quit like a woman if they're, if they're that kind of person, right? They do all the things that you can do. And then they are blown away to discover they can't stop any more than I can. Any more than that bum on the you know podcast recording that I was listening to couldn't stop. I can't stop either. Why? Alcohol use disorder is a mental illness, isn't it? Can't we treat these kind of things with the ordinary tools of mental illness type science? You know, psychotherapy, medication assisted treatment, et cetera. Well, perhaps... Some people can be treated that way. I assume that that's true. Uh, the book's authors even talk about, you know, instances where there are some people who can be helped by those things. Sure, there are. But some people who don't want to be called alcoholics are amazed that they try to stop and can't. Now, we, they say, the book's authors said, uh, who are familiar with the symptoms, see large numbers of potential alcoholics among young people everywhere. We'll go to page 34. But try and get them to see it. I love the old man energy uh, just radiating out of that sentence. And I would uh, expand this from just young people to I, uh, I'm familiar with the symptoms of alcoholism. I got quite familiar with them. I see large numbers of potential alcoholics everywhere, but oh, try to get them to see it. I see potential alcoholics in AA meetings that you can't get to see what the nature of their problem is. You'll tell them and you'll tell them and you'll tell them and they'll say, uh-huh, I understand, I understand, I understand. You'll say 12 steps. You'll say 90 meetings in 90 days. They'll say, you, you'll say a spiritual experience. They'll say, right, I'll get right to a meeting, right? Try to get them to see it. You can't do it. Um, but what can you do? This is the old man's lament, as you can tell them in their 40s. Now they say on page 34, as we look back, we feel we had gone on drinking many years beyond the point where we could quit on our willpower. I think that was true for me too. I don't know exactly when I entered that area. Obviously, I was able to abstain from alcohol for the first 17 years of my life without incident, but could I have stopped at 19? Could I have stopped at 25? Could I have stopped at 30? I don't know. I really don't know. But if you want to know, if you've entered this dangerous area, it's really easy to find out. Try it. They say if anyone questions whether he has entered this dangerous area, let him try leaving liquor alone for one year. Now, if you're anything like me, you read that sentence and you're wondering, do I really, do I really have to do the 12 steps? Do I really have to be, you know, hey, hey, hey. and it's like a, a, an ice grip comes on your heart a year. I thought you were going to say like a couple weeks. Um, <laughs> just, but it's a fair, isn't that fair? Oh, you can stop drinking? Oh, okay. Or well, do it. Go ahead. Go ahead then. <laughs> Go ahead and stop drinking. Just stop for a year and then you can drink all you want. How about that? Mm-hmm. If he's a real alcoholic, they say, and very far advanced, there is scant chance of success. Yeah, you better believe it. 
Um, in the very in the early days of our drinking, they say we occasionally remain sober for a year or more, become seri becoming serious drinkers again later. Now, I never had a period that was that long. But as I mentioned, in my 20s, I did stop drinking for some periods. I don't remember how long they were, um, but I did do that. I wasn't able to do that again later. And so they say, although you may yet be able, you may be able to stop for a considerable period, you may yet be a potential alcoholic, which I was. But here's the real here's the real point. If you're reading this book, mm, we think few to whom this book will appeal can stay dry anything like a year. And it's you know what a year is not that long. It flies by in certain ways. I just had a, somebody told me that a friend of mine was celebrating his forty first. Uh, sobriety anniversary today and i thought that can't be right he just had his 40th and i looked and i was like oh yeah he had it a year ago okay well i guess that makes sense that's how time works a year isn't that long but it sounds if you're reading this book it sounds impossible doesn't it that's because it is some people who try to do this will be drunk the day after making their resolutions i read that and i think the day after there's some people who made it to the next day that's very impressive uh most of them within a few weeks yeah i'll say I, speaking for myself, I really only entered the fellowship in my mid thirties and in, before I took the 12 steps of recovery, in other words, before I actually did the stuff to get recovered, I kind of wasted my time for years and years and years uh, in meetings, just doing stuff. That's not anything related to what's in this book, but just stuff I heard fellowship lore, trying to stay sober, basically on willpower and peer support. I did that for years. And in years of trying, I did not get to 60 days one time. I did not get to 30 days on my own power outside of a treatment center. I think I did that once right after treatment the very first time, never again. The idea that I could make it for even three months, a fantasy, absolute fantasy. When I when, it, when two weeks would pile up, I'd start to seriously think, wow, if I keep going like this, it'll be the, you know almost the longest I've ever been sober. Uh, I mean, I just couldn't do it, right? I was trying hard, very hard this whole period. And the crazy thing is the periods of time I was able to stay sober got shorter during that period, not longer. You know, usually when I try to do something and I'm not very good at it at first, and I keep trying and I keep reading and I keep learning and I keep practicing, I get, I might not get great, but I get better. Isn't that usually how it works? Certainly, I wouldn't ex have expected to get worse. But I got much worse, much, much worse. By the end, forget two weeks, forget one week. I couldn't stay sober for a long weekend without being literally handcuffed to my own couch, which I had basically, which I was, uh, to clear my mind sufficiently uh, to start working with uh, my sponsor because I needed, you know, you need a couple of days to clear your head. And so it's just, I put the, and these were real handcuffs, folks. Wouldn't have worked if they were fake ones. I promise you that. So yeah, I'll say, if you've got any, questions about whether you're, that's why I say people who, you know, they're not interested in the spiritual program or whatever, that's fine. Um, try and stop on your own power and one of two things will happen. You'll stop, in which case, problem solved. Go do something else. Have fun. Have a great time. Pick up golf, whatever you want to do. Or it won't work and I'll see you again. And if I see you again, then I hope that the way we're treating people there is not like we're, I'm going to see you again like a know-it-all. Not like I'm going to see you again to, to say I told you so. But what, but what we should convey, I think, is, look, if you're like me, here's what will happen. You're going to get a pretty good start. You'll feel good for a few days or a few weeks or, you know, depends on how long it is in your individual case. And then there will come a time, not that this chapter is all about, we're about to get to this, where you will have one of basically three incredibly predictable mental states. They will result in you drinking again. And in a short time, you will be asking yourself, how the hell did that happen? Now, I don't know because every person is different whether this will happen for you later today or a week, a month. Maybe you even could last for a year. I don't know. And maybe you'll be fine. But if you're like me, if you have already entered this dangerous area where you can't stay sober on your own power, you are going to have one of three mental states. And that is what the rest of this chapter is all about. We'll get to that in just a minute. So for those who are unable to drink moderately, the question is how to stop altogether. That's what this book, in a, a practical sense, is trying, it's trying to provide an answer to that question. Obviously, we're going to get into topics of spirituality, which go way beyond that question. But the practical thing that gets most people in the door is, I can't drink safely, so how do I stop drinking? 
They say we are assuming, of course, that the reader desires to stop. Very important question. For a while in my life, I think probably some of the reasons that I started drinking again in my 20s after stopping for a period is I didn't really want to stay stopped. So, you know, if a person doesn't want to stay stopped, then they don't have a problem that this book addresses. They don't need the 12 steps. A person who wants to drink needs $20 in the address of a liquor store. And I'll give you the address if you tell me where you live. You'll have to find the money on your own. The problem that I had toward the end of my life, or toward the end of my drinking career, not the end of my life, although it almost was, was I did not want to drink anymore, but I could not stop. So in that case, whether such a person can quit uh, upon a non-spiritual basis, they say, depends on the extent to which he's already lost the power to choose whether he will drink or not. This is why advice, like, just don't drink no matter what. That was maybe the earliest piece of advice. Actually, no, it's the second earliest piece of advice that I got in this fellowship that I can remember is don't just don't drink and go to the next meeting. The reason that advice is not helpful to a person like me is I had already lost the power to choose whether I would drink or not. So you're giving me a, an instruction that I can't follow. You might as well tell me just don't drink, sprout wings and fly to the next meeting. Well, I can't do that. I don't have wings. So how am I going to pull this off? Now, many of us, as they say, felt we had plenty of character in the sense of, you know, I can do hard things. I'd often done hard things in my life. Harder than this, this is an omission. It doesn't even require me to do anything. It is about not putting a, an inert substance into my body that, frankly, just about everybody around me is glad to support me not doing. Okay? There's a tremendous urge to cease forever. And there really was. By the end, there absolutely was. And that didn't seem to make any difference. That's what's weird. It really didn't make any difference that I really wanted to. I was not any better at stopping than when I kind of half wanted to. That was a real problem. Yet we found it impossible. I did too. This is the baffling feature of alcoholism as we know it. And it is baffling. This utter inability to leave it alone, no matter how great the necessity, no matter how great the wish, no matter how bad you've got to stay sober for your job, your family, for your health, for yourself. You've made promises. You, you just can't drink no matter what. No matter how great the necessity, you'll drink again. No matter how bad you don't want to drink again, you will, if you, at least I did, almost watch yourself at, like, at a certain point like you're just a, a passenger in your own body, watching yourself just walk to the elevator to go downstairs, to go across the street um, to the grocery store and buy a handle of vodka. It's astonishing to watch. And it is a baffling feature of alcoholism. It baffles the people around us. They look at our behavior and they don't get it either. They think to themselves, what is he doing? Why is he doing this? He knows that this is not good for him. Um, in one of his speeches to like a, the general AA convention, Bill W. tells a story uh, about the day, the armistice day that was the beginning of his last debauch that he talks about in Bill's story. And he tells a much longer version of that story and a much longer version of his um, meeting with his friend, Abby, and his early, early recovery. It's really good if you've never read it. I believe it's in the book As Bill Sees It or AA Comes of Age, perhaps. I think it's in AA Comes of Age. And he says that he, uh, on that day, went, uh, he's training to the golf course, and he spent this whole time um, telling this guy who was with him about all about how he was an alcoholic. He'd been sober for a little while at that point, and he said, yeah, I just can't drink. It has this effect on me. He tells him all about it. The two of them go to a little cafe. Uh, the bartender says, hey, it's our mistress day, boys. Have a drink on me. And Bill just takes it and drinks it. And the guy says, you must be crazy to do that after what you have just told me. And Bill's, Bill replies to him, I am. That's, it seems crazy watching us, right? It's just, I promise you, it's just as baffling from the inside. I don't know why I do it any more than you do. That's the crazy thing. It's, it's truly, truly baffling. And it's not like the, from the inside, it makes any more sense than it does from the outside. Hard to believe sometimes, but I assure you it is quite true. So how are we going to determine, how shall we help our readers determine to their own satisfaction. Your satisfaction. You're the one who has to know the answer to this. Not me. I don't care. Not that much. Not your mama's satisfaction or your partner's. You have to determine for yourself. Do I have the same problem that that guy from the podcast that I listened to have? Because if I do, 
then maybe I might be interested in trying the same solution. But if something is different, but if I'm not like that person, then maybe I should do something else. You got to determine this for yourself. They say, the, you know, we've already had the suggestion to want you have the experiment of quitting for a period of time. I think that will be helpful. The problem is, is you're going to, what, if you're anything like me, what you're going to do is you're going to do the experiment and then you'll drink after a little while. And what you will tell yourself is, well, I changed my mind. And that's what it feels like. I, it's not that I drank against my will. I just decided to start drinking again. And I admit now that that decision uh, didn't pan out the way that I was hoping. So I've decided to stop again, again, but I don't have some crazy mental blank spot. I just made a bad decision. What, you've never made a bad decision before? So I made a bad decision. Okay, I've learned my lesson. I'll try uh, this time. I'm not going to do that. Mm -hmm. You do that enough times, and you're going to start to wonder, am I, am I changing my mind? Or am I explaining what, I, what is happening with a little story I'm telling myself after the fact? So the experiment of quitting for a period of time will be helpful, but we think we can render, they say, an even greater service to alcoholic sufferers and perhaps to the medical fraternity. So we shall describe, and this is on page 35, some of the mental states that precede a relapse into drinking, for obviously this is the crux of the problem. Now let's get clear on why we are describing these. The first, I have a note in my book, God, I, I love my younger self sometimes. He was such a sweet, a sweet young man. I wrote, watch out for these. Uh, <laughs> oh, doesn't it break your heart? Yes, watch out. Watch out if these things happen, then don't, then don't do it. <laughs> um, that's not the reason we're learning about these. Because if these mental states that precede a relapse happen to you, as we will see, they're not the kinds of things you can watch out for. That's not what we're talking about. What these are useful for is you, if you learn about these and then you try to quit on your own power and these happen to you, you might remember that, oh yeah, that I remember that they said something like this was gonna happen. In fact, one of the guys in the stories here says something almost exactly like that. The point I think of these stories is to plant a seed in your mind so that the next time you are in the situation that our friend Jim is about to be in, or the situation that our friend Fred is about to be in, or whatever, something might trouble you. And you might think, uh-oh, this is disturbingly exactly what I heard those AA people talking about. And I wonder if that means that maybe I don't have the power to choose whether I drink or not, and I just think I do. I think that's one of the most useful things about this. So let's take a look at it. What sort of thinking dominates an alcoholic? Dominates an alcoholic. These thoughts dominate us, the other way around, who repeats time after time the desperate experiment of the first drink. Friends who have reasoned with him after a spree, which has brought him to the point of divorce or bankruptcy, are mystified when he walks directly into a saloon, just like I was talking about, right? Or family. Why does he do that? Of what is he thinking? What's going on in your mind grapes when that happens? It'd be one of three things, I pretty much guarantee you. The first example is a friend that we shall call Jim. I love Jim. Whiskey milk Jim. No, spoiler alert. This man has a charming wife and family. Congrats on all your success, Jim. He inherited a lucrative automobile agency. Well, it sounds like you're set up for life. Mendable World War record. Good salesman. Everybody likes Jim. Intelligent man. Normal, so far as we can see, except for a nervous disposition. I love he just catches the stray on that one. Yeah, I mean, he's a little nervous, but you know, just unnecessary to the story. Love that part. And he doesn't start drinking at all until he's 35 years old. Okay, so in a few years, he'd become so violent and intoxicated, when intoxicated, that he had to be committed. And upon leaving the asylum, he came into contact with us. Pretty clear what's happening so far, right? He doesn't drink at all until the time he's 35. So it's not until pretty late in life, after he's already had the chance to kind of work up a lot of success for himself, that he discovers that he's like me, and maybe like you. He doesn't react to alcohol in the normal way. In fact, he seems to react to it maybe even more abnormally than I do. I don't use that. I don't say that lightly. Um, but so very rapidly, he discovers he cannot control his drinking at all. And when drunk, he's a real troublemaker. So um, he's presumably quite baffled by this. He comes into contact with our friends in early AA. And they told him what they knew of alcoholism. 
and the answer that they, that they had found. And I'm sure he listens and he thinks, very interesting. Okay, got it. Just got to stay away from that first drink. Different reaction than other people. Okay, sure. He had made a beginning, they say. His family's reassembled. Good. He began to work as a salesman for the business he had lost for drinking. Okay, all went well for a time. But he failed to enlarge his spiritual life. I would really impress on you, my dear listener, burn those words into your consciousness, into your innermost self, right next to the words, I'm an alcoholic. Burn it in. He failed to enlarge, enlarge, grow his spiritual life. That is what undid Jim. He failed to enlarge his spiritual life. As we will see later in this book, it is easy to let up on the program of action. We're headed for trouble if we do. Because of course it's easy to let up. Nobody likes to do work if they don't have to do work. Everybody likes to be lazy if they can be lazy. And Jim, he does all the things that these guys suggest, right? He probably assembles some kind of proto inventory, makes, makes amends, confesses his defects to another person, et cetera. And maybe he tries to do a little bit of work with others, right? But, you know, then he kind of puts his attention on something else. Sounds like he kind of put his attention, um, you know, on reassembling his family, trying to make some money for himself, all that stuff, all good things, all good things. But he stops enlarging his spiritual life. To his consternation, he found himself drunk. Consternation. To his surprise, wow, I didn't expect that to happen. Where did that come from? Um, half a dozen times in rapid succession. On each of those occasions, we worked with him, reviewing carefully what happened. Very good lesson there for us uh, as if we're recovered people who are working with new people. I think it is extremely, extremely useful that when you have a person who experiences a relapse and, you know, of course, you want to give them some encouragement. Um, I have lots of thoughts on working with people after relapses. I think that we are often sending very negative messages to those people when actually relapse is uh, in some ways quite a positive occasion. But one of the best things you can do is walk with them through exactly what happened in exactly the way that these guys do here. And what you're going to get initially, if your people are anything like my people, is you're going to get a lot of you know, like kicking their own ass. Let's get out of that mode, right? We're not here to say, well, what I should have done was this, and I know better, and I just screwed up. Okay, enough negative self-talk, right? If we've really internalized the first step message, there should be no reason for guilt because you have not you don't have the power to choose whether you will drink or not. So why should you feel bad about drinking? And also, why should you feel good about not drinking, right? If it's completely out of your hands. Sorry to all the time counters out there. Um, but it's helpful to work through on each of these occasions and say, what happened? Walk me through your thinking as best you can. And let's see if we can identify where you are in this chapter. That's very useful because it's hard to believe some of this stuff until it actually happens to you. Let me tell you about my last relapse on this subject. This is what I mean. The last time I started back up again, uh, I had been sober for, with the help of a treatment center, five or six weeks. So I think the longest I had ever been sober since trying to get and stay recovered. I was feeling really good. I had gone to a really uh, nice treatment center close to my home here in Southern California. I had done it on the dime of my beloved mama, so I didn't even have to pay the money for it. Um, I had support from my family, my friends, people in my life really were there for me. It was really nice. Um, my partner came and visited me every day while I was there, bringing our very cute little dachshund, you know, you name it. I kept my job, all was going well. I received really good care, and I was just truly optimistic and feeling positive and determined about the future. Not a cloud on the sky. Now, everything wasn't perfect in life, of course, but it's never perfect. This was just about as close to an ideal set of circumstances as you could possibly get. One day, I was sitting on my couch, and I had started a fourth step working through the instructions in this book, and I wasn't working very hard at it. I had it sitting on my dining room table out. I had a notebook. I was writing the columns. I'd written a list of names, and I was kind of, you know, I was doing it. I'd do a little bit every day, kind of dilly-dallying. What's the rush, right? Don't microwave your sobriety. Um, so sitting on my couch, it was probably three in the afternoon, four in the afternoon. And out of nowhere, 
the thought just came into my head that this was a Thursday or a Friday. And the thought just came into my head, you know, it would really be fun to get drunk and high this weekend. And then, of course, I think, what? Well, no, 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 no. Can't, obviously, can't do that. Can't do that. But the temptation is so strong that I wake up my partner who's napping, talk to her all about it. She says, I'm, I'm glad you woke me up, doing the right thing, proud of you, all this different stuff. She goes back to sleep. I sit back down on the couch. And I feel better. And I think to myself, that's right. You know, because the truth is I really can't, uh, I really can't drink safely. I, I can't, I can't get high in a safe way. Uh, it always turns into, I'm never able to control it. So I just can't do it. That's why it's so important that I'm going to have to make sure that I just keep it this weekend. What? It's like I, and when I was saying this to myself, I could hear, I can't control it. So I better control it. I knew that that was insane. And I watched myself just get up, walk out the door and do it anyway. And that is when I went from feeling bad about myself, feeling guilty, feeling like I wasn't trying hard enough, feeling like if I really, if, this, if people, if my, you know, my family really mattered to me, if, my, if, it, if I really loved God enough, if this, if that, I'd try harder. I went from feeling bad about myself to feeling scared because I realized, oh my God, I, I'll never be able to try harder than that. I'll never be able to have a set of conditions more ideal than those. I'll never be able to have more support from the people around me, never be able to have more, a better reason um, to, get, to get sober and stay that way. And nothing even happened. Nothing happened. It was the middle of a normal day and nothing was going on. And I applied all my will. I used all the, you know, re reached out, did all this stuff, reminded myself. I played the tape through. I did all that stuff. And it bought me 15 minutes. Then that I, is when I started to feel like, okay, I am going to die this way. I'm going to die this way. And that was my thinking, essentially, is that this time would be different. And that is what Jim thinks, too. Let's see, let's see how he does. So Jim agrees, we're still on page 35, that he was a real alcoholic and in a serious condition. Okay? I knew that, too. He knew he faced another trip to the asylum or as we more politely refer to it these days, the psychiatric ward of the local hospital. I had made more than one trip to those wards myself, not always uh, voluntarily, if he kept on. Moreover, he would lose his family, me too, for whom he had a deep affection, me too. Yet he got drunk again, top of page 36, me too. We asked him to tell us exactly how it happened. How did it happen? This is his story. And what's great about this is I really do get the sense that they were pretty much writing down exactly what Jim told them. Here's a little quiz for you. I'll tell you the answer at the end. When does Jim say the reason that he took another drink that day? When does, when does he explain why it happened? Okay, Just listen and see if you can spot it. And I'll tell you the answer at the end. I came to work on a Tuesday morning. I remember I felt irritated that I had to be a salesman for a concern I once owned. Remember, he inherited that automobile agency or whatever, and now he has to work as a salesman for it. I had a few words with the boss. He had to work on a Tuesday morning, by the way. He doesn't say what happened on Monday. I wonder if the boss was like, hey, where the hell were you on Monday? Who knows? But nothing serious. Then I decided to drive into the country and see one of my prospects for a car. Remember, he's a car sale. And apparently this was pretty common back in the 1930s is you'd go out somebody in the country and see if you could sell him a car. On the way, I felt hungry. So I stopped at a roadside place where they have a bar. I had no intention of drinking. I just thought I would get a sandwich. I also had the notion that I might find a customer for a car at this place, which was familiar for I had been going to it for years. Sounds fine. I had eaten there many times during the months I was sober. So he's been sober for you know, months at this point. I sat down at the table, ordered a sandwich and a glass of milk. Still no thought of drinking. Okay. No thought of drinking. I think it's useful to take him seriously. So he's telling the truth here. He has not, no desire to drink at all. Just eating lunch. Fine. I ordered another sandwich and decided to have another glass of milk. The next paragraph is uh, very interesting. Suddenly the thought crossed my mind that if I were to put an ounce of whiskey in my milk, 
it couldn't hurt me on a full stomach. Hmm? What? <laughs> DJ, could you run that back? Suddenly the thought crossed my mind that if I were to put an ounce of whiskey in my milk, it couldn't hurt me on a full stomach. First of all, gross. So gross. Second, what? What? I ordered a whiskey and poured it into the milk. I vaguely sensed I was not being any too smart. Mm -hmm. He has a sense. Some Yes, okay. But I felt reassured as I was taking the whiskey on a full stomach. So asking the question, when does Jim explain why he decided that he was going to take another drink? The answer is he doesn't because he didn't decide. He doesn't know. This is a story he's telling. These are the events that happened beforehand. But he didn't choose to drink that day. This is what happened. This is the epiphenomena. These are the thoughts that he had to justify. The story he told to justify to himself the decision that was already made, although he didn't know it. He sensed he wasn't being any too smart. That was the little part of him that was kind of like yelling up from like the like third sub basement, like, Jim, no, play the tape through, tell our sponsor, 9090, all that stuff that we've heard, right? And he just says, oh, he's fine. I'm drinking on a full stomach, baby. Now, Jim's not a dumb guy, not a dumb guy at all. Jim's got plenty of experience with alcoholism. He knows that's not right, just like I knew. That it was not true that I could keep it to that weekend, and I did not. But all I just felt reassured. If I'll keep it to this weekend, I'll be fine. If I drink it on a full stomach, I'll be okay. And guess what? The experiment went so well. Uh-oh. The phenomenon of craving has been triggered. Uh-oh. Jim drinks essentially because he likes the effect produced, just like me. Uh-oh. So I what? Ordered another whiskey and poured it into more milk. I love that he at least bothered to get more milk, too. I'm so responsible of you, Jim. That didn't seem to bother me, so I tried another. We are three whiskeys in here off of an idea that he is about to admit, candidly, is insane. Thus started one more journey to the asylum for Jim. Here is a guy with every reason in the world not to drink. Just like I had every reason in the world not to drink. Threat of commitment, loss of family and position, to say nothing of that intense mental and physical suffering. Right? With alcohol withdrawals can kill you. They're not pleasant. And I had already been through, as the time of that last relapse, I had already been through the DTs laying in my bed, had a little seizure laying in my bed. At least I think that's what it was. I don't really know. I was getting alcoholic neuropathy where the nerve endings in your like fingers and like your extremities start feeling, they start dying. And so you start to get numbness all over your body. Um, and grossest of all, my poo-poo was starting to smell really bad because I destroyed, I think, the lining of my stomach and wasn't digesting food anymore. So it was just rotting in my tummy. And then I would, yeah, not good. I'd already been through all of that. Um, and yet, to say, you know, much knowledge about himself as an alcoholic. He had that too. I did I did as well. I read this book. I could probably have told you beat for beat the Whiskey Milk Jim story. Absolutely. Uh, I owned the copy of the book that I'm holding and reading from right now. I'd owned it actually for many years at that point. I'd been to rehab more than once. I'd been to like a million zillion AA meetings. I knew all about alcoholism, didn't I? Yet all reasons for not drinking were easily pushed aside in favor, top of page 37, of the foolish idea that he could take whiskey if only he mixed it with milk. This time will be different, and here's how. That is mental state number one that can precede a relapse. You come up with some insanely trivial reason, some insanely thing in retrospect you absolutely don't even defend, that you can't defend, that doesn't make sense to you even now, a few days later, and you say, this is why it will be different. This time, I'll be fine, because I'm, in my case, I'm just going to keep it to this weekend, and then, boop, stop. Even though I tried that before, and it never worked before, but this time it will. Jim, I'm going to mix it with milk and a full stomach. Now, let me ask you, do you think that Jim had ever had any whiskey on a full stomach before? I mean, he's an alcoholic. He'd gotten locked up in the asylum. I assume that he was often drinking after meals. Do you think he probably knew that you could still get drunk after you eat a sandwich? I think he probably did know that. And I don't think telling Jim, yeah, Jim, listen, your mistake was you thought you couldn't get drunk if you ate a sandwich first, but you can. 
And now you have more self-knowledge and this problem won't happen again. No, because he wasn't, that's not what he was drinking. That's a story he's telling himself about why this, why he did this thing, but he was not at, in the driver's seat on that. This is the story. It's like if a little kid sits in a car next to the person driving and like, you know, swings the wheel back and forth, their little toy wheel, like in the intro of the Simpsons. You know what I mean? They're not driving the car. You're just in the front seat holding something that looks like a wheel. Okay. Whatever the price definition of the word may be, they say, we call this plain insanity. And this book uses the word insane several times, and this is what they mean by it. This inability in the crucial moment to call to mind the things that you know are true. The way the doctor's opinion puts it is, we lose the ability to distinguish the true from the false. That's what's happening to Jim, isn't it? Isn't that? And that's definitely what was happening to me. I had this thought, I was convinced it was true, and it wasn't. And I, I knew it wasn't, but it seemed true at the time. Uh, my friend and sponsor likes to call this the idea of a liar that lives in his head. It's always threatening to come out of remission. Same idea across the board. How can such a lack of proportion of the ability to think straight, they say, be called anything else? Now, they say, you might think this is an extreme case. Well, I don't. I don't think it's an extreme case at all. I don't think actually that any alcoholic who has suffered for a long time or any act of any description who has suffered a long time with the inability to stop will actually find this to be hard to believe whatsoever. I believe 100% this is exactly what happened. They say to us, it is not far-fetched. To, to, because here's the thing. A normal person might read this book and read that and be like, that is bullshit. That never happened. That is what people, if I told them stories about my own life, would probably think is he's lying to tell, to, I don't know why he's lying, but that never happened. Whereas when I read that, I'm like, that definitely happened. And it happened exactly like he said. Um, they say to us, it's not far-fetched for this kind of thinking has been characteristic of every single one of us. And they say, we've sometimes reflected more than Jim did upon the consequences. And that's true. Sometimes, you like the story I was telling, it seems to have happened to Jim even faster than my 15 or 20 minutes. Jim basically had the thought and acted on it almost immediately. Sometimes we hold out for 15, 20 minutes. Sometimes we even get lucky and are able to put the insane thought away for like a day and we get a little stay of execution. But there was always the curious mental phenomenon that parallel means right next to our sound reasoning, right? I can't drink safely. I know that all my experience, my firm resolution, I've told everybody I won't. I got good reasons to stop, Choo -choo, right? That's, that's one little train on a track. Parallel to that, there inevitably ran some insanely trivial excuse for taking the first drink. Something stupid, something that doesn't make sense, something that you may not even remember later. I was listening to a guy the other day talk about a relapse that had happened to him, and it was as simple as this. He'd been sober for a few months, was really, you know, was happy about his life. He was on a business trip. He goes down to the um, hotel restaurant uh, to watch a basketball game and eat dinner. Sits next to a couple. They're having a great time. He eats his dinner. He's drinking, I don't know, ginger ale, maybe milk and is having fun. They offer him a glass of wine from their bottle. He says, no, thanks. They order a second bottle of wine. They offer him another glass and he says, sure. And his explanation was, I don't know why I said yes the second time. I guess I just did. Yes, now we're getting close to the truth. I don't know why I said yes the second time. Exactly, you don't. The insanely trivial excuse that he gave was just like, you don't wanna be rude. You don't wanna be rude. You're destroying your life with alcohol. You're not willing to be rude to two strangers you've never met before. And it's also not rude to say no. That's the thing. It doesn't make sense. When we say this, that's the problem is when we when we tell the truth about why we took that first drink to people, it sounds so stupid that it sounds like we're insulting their intelligence. Like, you don't really expect me to believe that you started drinking again because you thought you could do it if you'd mixed it with milk. I mean, give me a little credit, man. Don't lie to my face. But it's true. It's, it's, it's that crazy. Our sound reasoning fails to hold us in check. The insane idea wins out. And the next day, this is in the middle page 37, we would ask ourselves in all earnestness, we really mean this, in all sincerity, how did this happen? Why did I do that? And I'm convinced if you hooked us up to lie detector test at that moment, we would render as 100% truthful. Like, no, I really, I really did want to stay. So I really want to not drink. I don't know. That doesn't make, no, it doesn't make sense. I'm convinced that we would be as bewildered as the people around us. 
that's the first kind of mental state. And I think a very, very powerful and common one that you can convey either, you know, maybe you can keep it on your own mind. If you're listening to this as a person who's not yet recovered, or you can convey to the people that you work with as, you know, just keep this in mind, Put put whiskey milk gym in the back of your head. Well, you know, this time will be different. Some stupid reason for taking the first drink. And if you walk them, walk, work with a person, walk them through, I mean, they get to the dumb reason that they took the first drink that they know is dumb. Instead of saying, you know, yeah, we got to beat you up and you got to kick your own ass over this. Why don't you say, now, wait, now, hold on a second. That's dumb and you know it's dumb. Who else do we know that's like that? Who else do we know started drinking again for a reason that, that really does it? It's kind of so silly, it's hard not to laugh. Yeah, there's that guy, Whiskey Milk Jim. Interesting. So you're kind of like a person in the in the chapter more about alcoholism. What do we take from that? They say in some circumstances, we have gone out deliberately to get drunk. In other words, I know that I can't drink safely. I don't care. I'm going to do it anyway. Okay? Feeling our oh, justified by nervousness, anger, worry, depression, jealousy, whatever, bad mood, maybe even a good mood. And you might think, well, that, that proves it. I'm just changing my mind there. I'm just being irresponsible. I got to stop doing this. Hmm, really? Even in this type of beginning, we are, we are obliged to admit. You got to admit that there is something weird about that, though, right? Our justification for a spree is always insanely insufficient in light of what always happened. I may be having a bad day, actually a horrible day. But I know by this point that no matter how angry or depressed or worried or jealous or nervous that I am, I know that another spree is going to make that much worse, much, much, much worse, right? We now see that when we begin to drink deliberately instead of casually, there was little serious or effective thought, effective thought during the pre period of premeditation of what the terrific consequences might be. Yeah, it feels like I'm thinking it through and changing my mind and making a bad decision. But that can't really be right. I can't really have been doing, I mean, unless I'm, I mean, it would, be, it would be actually suicidal at a certain point. And I think many of us alcoholics and addicts do start to feel like that. Like we are, we must be just deliberately trying to kill ourselves. And often that starts to seem pretty appealing if we can't find a way out. Luckily, there is one. And then we'll, we've got this analogy. And I love this analogy for a lot of reasons. This is the analogy of the jaywalker. This air behavior is as absurd and incomprehensible with respect to the first drink as that of an individual with passion, say, for jaywalk. He gets a thrill out of skipping in front of fast-moving vehicles. He enjoys himself for a few years in spite of friendly warnings. Up to this point, you would label him as a foolish chap, having the queer ideas of fun. It's page 38. Okay? Fun-loving. This is the fun-loving period. This is the, this is the fun period. Certainly remember that. Luck then deserts him and he is slightly injured several times in succession. You would expect him, if he were normal, to cut it out. This is kind of me in my 20s a little bit, right? I'm starting to have trouble because of my inability to control the amount I drink. I'm starting to get in little scrapes, nothing big yet, just interpersonal scrapes. Basically, I'm a bad boyfriend on dates or you know, bad to hang out with on certain occasions. Nothing huge yet, but it's starting to affect me. So you would think, if I'm normal, cut it out, right? Presently, he's hit again. This time, it's a fractured skull. Within a week after leaving the hospital, a fast-moving trolley car breaks his arm. He tells you he's decided to stop jaywalking for good, but in a few weeks, breaks both legs. On through years, this conduct continues, accompanied by his continual promises to be careful or to keep off the streets altogether. Finally, he can no longer work. His wife gets a divorce. He's held up to ridicule. He tries every known means to get the jaywalking idea out of his head. He shuts himself up in an asylum, hoping to mend his ways. But the day he comes out, he races in front of a fire engine, drunk on the way home from rehab, like I was one time, which breaks his back. Such a man would be crazy, wouldn't he? Yeah, right? The definition of insanity we were working with before, the inability to, to get this, just to know the true from the false, to get the jaywalking idea out of your head. Now, you might think that illustration is too ridiculous. You read that to a normal person, and they will, again, they'll be like, that's, that's funny to imagine. But you read that to an alcoholic or an addict, 
and they see themselves in every particular. When I read that the first time, you didn't have to explain it to me. You did not have to explain the ways in which this looked exactly like my life, because it does. Normal people don't behave that way, but alcoholics and addicts do. And what's so useful about this is they say, you may think our illustration too ridiculous, but is it? We who have been through the ringer have to admit, if we substituted alcoholism for jaywalking, the illustration would fit us exactly. Yes. However intelligent we may have been in other respects, where alcohol has been involved, we've been strangely insane. Right, in the sense we've been discussing, insane in that sense of thinking this time will be different or thinking that I'll do it on purpose, even though that doesn't really make sense, et cetera. But strong language, insane, that is strong language, but isn't it true? And check this out. This is what's interesting. If you substitute alcoholism for jaywalking, then the example fits me exactly. And if you substitute certain kind of drug use for jaywalking, the example fits me perfectly. But I know people for whom you could substitute other things for jaywalking. And the example would fit them perfectly, would fit them just as perfectly as it fits me. I talk to people all the time who have addictions who are quite different than mine. Process addictions, sex stuff, you name it, pornography, you know, different drugs than me. Runs the gamut. Gambling, right? Oh, boy, that's a scary one, isn't it? You substitute gambling for jaywalking. And I think, you know, you get a gambling addict. They say, that fits me exactly. Destroy my life over this. And on the way home, boop, I stop at a, you know, stop at a place to buy a lottery ticket or casino or whatever their particular pattern is. I think that what that demonstrates is that the, the addictive pattern, the alcoholic pattern, the specific thing that we are doing instead of jaywalking is not the thing that really is at the root. We have something in common that is deeper than that because what can work for me is what could probably work for the jaywalker and what I know can work for the gambling addict and what I know can work for the uh, addicts of different kinds of drugs that I never used in my entire life. Something about this compulsion, this obsessive compulsion, this obsession of the mind is similar across all of these different addictive patterns that all of us can find an analog in the jaywalker. Well, if I, if I can substitute myself for the jaywalker and you can substitute for yourself for the jaywalker, then aren't we crazy in exactly the same way? You're doing it with heroin. I'm doing it with alcohol, cocaine. What's the difference really if we're both ultimately just the jaywalker in the story? So a little food for thought there. I think it's quite true. Been going for about an hour and we're going to stop there. This is really a, a wonderful part of the book. And I want to thank you guys very much for being here with me uh, and uh, participating. So thanks very much. I'm going to stop the recording right there.